particular protocol, the particular implementation of this protocol, some sort of request for a key. We receive the key. Let's use a different one. See if we can try and, because we already support the protocol, try and cause some sort of logical flaw or session-based flaw that will actually trigger something in this application. So fudding is not just random input. In my opinion, random input cannot be just dismissed, but it can definitely be used a lot more smartly than just dumping random shit into, sorry for saying shit, fuck, okay. <laughs> just dumping random shit into parameters like Barton Miller did back 20 years ago. The technology advanced a little bit since then. Now, what's smart fuzzing and why all the buzz? Can anybody tell me what, in, really in simple terms, because I want to get through all these slides in about two minutes because now I'm actually on the clock. Can anybody tell me what smart fuzzing is? Okay, you. Don't sit in the front row ever, ever. <laughs> the cool guys are always all the way in the back saying, look at this fat fellow over there telling us what fuzzing is. Come on, I wrote a fuzzer when I was eight years old. Okay, I think smart fuzzing. You mean you know what smart fuzzing is and you did not volunteer to answer? I'm shocked. Okay. <laughs> no, I want an excuse right now. Why didn't you just raise your hand and say, me, 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 I know what smart fuzzing is. I'm scary, ain't I? Uh, doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, smart fuzzing is if I uh, take a look what the program expects and only some parts are random and the other parts are uh, what the program expects. So you can... Do what the program expects. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, guys, is smart because they actually did sum it up in one line and did not know where to go from there. Because, hey, let's see what the program expects. Let's not just send stuff and see what happens to the program, see what the pro or the environment, see what the program itself expects. And why this is so smart is because if we know, for example, just, and notice I'm not going too far ahead here. Let's choose HTTP again. If we know what HTTP looks like, again, we can actually not just send blah, 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 255 times, or 1,000 times, or whatever, how many times we want. We can do something smarter, which will likely cause the program to fail. And we will go more into that again, but that's a little bit of repeating. Smart fuzzing, in my opinion, is doing a lot more than that. It's forgetting the idea that the fuzzer is actually a client. Can anybody tell me what they think I mean by that? Because I'm not sure I mean what I mean by that. No, okay. Well, by meaning that the of a client, when we use fuzzing, again, there are many different um, approaches. We can use proxies. We can use many in the middle over a router or whatever else we want to do to watch the traffic, analyze it on the fly, and generate whatever it is we want to fuzz on the fly from the packets we observe. That is very useful. Of course, we'll naturally never pass more than 1% of the protocol usage. And if we have some sort of printer bug like we did in IIS, we're screwed and we'll never find it. But usually what you do with fuzzing is you emulate the client, meaning if we go with HTTP, I'll try and be a browser. Right? I'll try and send something that will crash the server or the, the other way around, naturally. And I'm saying, hey, that's smart. And we can probably make it smarter. We can probably send in requests. We can do an exhaustive test and test what billions of different combinations and eliminate some of those that are really repeating themselves or are kind of redundant and get down to millions of combinations if we're really smart. But that's still just sending stuff in and expecting for something to happen, an exception maybe. And you know what? That's kind of getting on my nerves lately. What's so fucking difficult about doing something very, very simple, which many of us have done over the past years, such as putting some sort of debugger on the host of what we attack. That would be a very passive approach. Put the debugger over there, wait for the exception, and see what happens. Now, what if we did something a little bit extra? For example, we monitor the CPU, CPU usage. That's very, very simple to do. It's not always very simple to actually take that information and do something with it. We may be able, we may be able for example, to take that information and lower or increase the number of requests we send per second, but taking the information about CPU usage, memory usage, looking for perhaps memory issues, not necessarily memory leaks, is not very simple. Using some sort of um, 
software on the host itself, which can, for example, trace the binary, be a profiler, see what's actually happening, or try to count, hey, how many times did we actually discover this particular path in the tree of the binary? What functions did we access and how many times and what type of request did we send? Try and be smarter about our fuzzing is something that not many people do when we still, we're still stuck mostly in the world of clients. So in my opinion, smart fuzzing is anything that is beyond just sending requests all the time using the client. But hey, the road is still ahead. People say today that there is no, not much ground to cover yet with fuzzing. We have done pretty much everything that we could. And from this point on, it's just repeating ourselves. I'm not sure that's true. But for now, smart fuzzing actually means what this guy said. Send in input that's a little bit smarter, which means, hey, don't send all the exhaustive uh, protocol space. Send first the request that actually might trigger vulnerability in our experience. What is more likely to trigger buffer overflow and off by one or any other type of vulnerability? So that's smart fuzzing. Yeah, that wasn't two minutes. Um, is smart fuzzing up to the task? OK. Exhaustive vers versus targeted, I believe we covered that. Uh, software testing versus security testing. Can anybody tell me? Actually, yeah. Can anybody tell me why there is an actual distinction here between software testing and security testing? Um, the difference between software testing versus security testing is software testing is more likely to be from the user side. Security testing is uh, via the, um, let's say, what input can be, um, uh, or mal input can be used to, uh, or malicious input can be used to test the software, or beyond the, um, use, uh, let's say, requirements of the software itself. <laughs> So basically, if I can take what you, you're, what you said is correct, you're on the spot. But if I can take what you say, change it, alter it completely, and use it for my purposes, I would say that software testing is regular testing. We want to find bugs, period. Security testing is much like software testing. We want to find bugs, but we much rather find bugs that are exploitable. And then we look for vulnerabilities. If you talk to QA people, and this is where we start our actual discussion of our organization to use this, you, they will say, what? You're not testing for everything? Seriously? And I will say, no, no, really. I believe in exhaustive testing. I want to test as much as possible. But I actually want to get results by tomorrow morning. And if I want to get results by tomorrow morning, or you know what, fine, I'll test for an entire year, 12 months now. But how about for the first day I test for things that are very likely to exploit something? Would that be useful? Can I go over CVEs over the past, look at vulnerabilities that often happen in certain types of applications that use them first, try to exploit them first. Does that make any sense? And to QA engineers, it doesn't. And no matter how much we can reiterate the subject, it simply doesn't. And that's when, where the problem starts. Because say you take a fuzzer, say, say you take Spike, OK, or any other type of fuzzer, and give it to a QA engineer. Now, QA engineers are very good people. But most of them really do not want to see code in any way. They want to see an exception, period. Now, not all vulnerabilities in any way will trigger an exception. You need to monitor the program a lot smarter than that. And I'm not just saying monitor it with a profiler, like I said earlier, but actually, how about looking at the logs that the software produ uh, produ produces? Why not actually check what logs you want to be produced to begin with? And this is a big issue when talking to corporations. Now, now, in the year 2006, almost 2007, we have more reliable tools, meaning Spike was great, but you had to be Dave Vitell to actually make it work. It kept crashing. So, I mean, I see some people here actually use Spike. That's pretty cool. And so once we provide with more reliable tools, corporations can actually use them, which is great. So I, I'm waiting for somebody to, add, to actually say, what do we care if corporations use fuzzing tools? We will them because it's fun. New frameworks, better frameworks, which means we can provide an organization with, say, a fuzzer, which is an engine, and drive that fuzzer using, say, XML, or some other type of protocol building aid that we can just tell them, hey, you have a proprietary protocol, that's great. Just enter the specs in here, and we'll fuzz it for you. So we have better frameworks that will help us not just repeat our engine, repeat our technology and rebuild our technology and build new engines, but actually use something that will last and they'll be able to teach the people after them and preserve the knowledge inside the organization. 
And then we had another advancement, which comes in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, actually, per, which is commercial fuzzing tools. Now, some of you probably say, fuck that right now. But how many, how many people here actually work for big, big organizations? Raise your hands. Come on. I know we, are all, we have all sold out long, a long time ago. OK, I'll take that as that we are all either under 18 or work for bigger corporations. So <clears throat> thank you, traders. So organizations will usually choose to use the obvious, which means, hey, let's choose something that will have support. Can we get support for Spike today? Can we pay for support for Spike today? No. Um, <laughs> good luck. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I want to pay for support for Spike, but thank you very much for offering. Um, and actually, that's the way it works with open source. We have a lot of open source um, consultancies that offer support and other such um, liability issues, cover such liability issues for big corporations that they can actually use open source. One of the big issues with corporations not using open source is they th they're saying, who's the mother or father of this tool? Who is going to actually help me if I have problems tomorrow? How do I know this tool doesn't disappear tomorrow and the maintainer goes to, goes to the university or something? So this is actually critical. And the commercial world, although expensive, actually brought in more manpower, more development, and more ideas, as well as money, than the fuzzing world ever had. It, was, it, it moved, really, from homegrown tools to the commercial level. So in the past, we, have, we had fuzzing enthusiasts. I guess some of us here, right? Um, corporations with fuzzing enth enthusiasts, which means, well, there was Matthew Franz for Cisco. Anybody ever seen his presentations? Or read his stuff? No? Um, we had people at Microsoft. We had people in a lot of places. Symantec as a person who is really great. Orlando, if anybody knows him, who does fuzzing. But basically, it was at the same level. They developed their own fuzzing tools and used them in their own software security teams in order to find vulnerabilities once the products are completed or in testing for some odd reason. They were not the actual development team. They were not the actual QA team. They were lone wolves. They were hackers. Now, right. Now, Cisco, Microsoft, Juniper, AT&T, Symantec, they all use fuzzing extensively. I'm not sure if this surprises anybody because fuzzing has been here for years. Nothing new, right? Why all the buzz in the papers all of a sudden, right? I mean, for people who have worked on fuzzing for, say, 10 years or 5 years or even 2 years, saying fuzzing is going to save the world kind of pieces us all off, right? What, what's the big idea? So the usage right now is no longer limited to one elite group or another, but rather integrated into the development process. So everybody starts talking about it. It's, it's new now. Live with it. Now, one of the biggest issues of integrated fuzzing into the vendor uh, development process or the cycle is to be actual, actually be able to work with other security QA tools. There are no real security QA tools today, but it's a world that's forming right now. And Two or three years down the road, I can see a Sun certification for a secu security QA um, analyst or something like that coming, and people will actually take it. So how do we work with other QA tools, such as, for example, code analysis? Should fuzzing, which is black box, box testing, just sending input and seeing what the output is, actually work together with code analysis, code auditing, static analysis, splint? How do we make, we make that work? Because if the corporation currently uses some sort of tools, they want to integrate it all together and get the maxima ma maximize their results. So we can also put them in as standalone tools. Say, hey, establish a new group within, say, I'm just arbitrarily choosing Cisco. And that group will check with fuzzing. We'll check with code editing tools. We'll, all, we'll have false positives, but a lot of results. You'll have no false positives, meaning exceptions, but nearly no results. And we'll have fun. So where do you integrate them? And what are the challenges of integrating them with the QA environment? So now that there are really little to no excuses left for vendors to actually test the software, and when, let me actually re 